a political prognostication. I think that poor Barbara McDougall, sometime Sun reporter, Minister of State for Finance, is going to be the scapegoat for the unbelievable inefficiency of the banking system in Canada. And the question at the top of my mind is, why do we, the public, have to pour billions in to save every bank that gets into trouble because it's overextended itself on dubious loans? I don't know if many people will agree with me, but I've got one guy here this morning called James Dean, who is a critic of the banking system. He's a professor of economics at my university. This is Dr. Webster speaking. We'll see if he's going to be forthright about it or if we just have to keep draining the public purse and guarantee everybody's money in every bank across the country. That's number one. Number two, I will again be at the mercy of the inimitable Margaret Atwood. Every book she sells is a bestseller. And unlike Pierre Burton's books, which are bestsellers for coffee tables, her books deserve to be bestsellers. The one she's going to talk about this morning, although I'll be after her on all the feminist issues, is a bit of a nightmare. It's a futuristic book about what may happen to women if we, as signs would indicate, return to the worst kind of puritanism. So that should be good fun with Margaret Atwood. And then there's a fellow coming in this morning who's one of the loudest. He's the raging rock of bull, the raging bull of rock. And uh, you're going to see... That was very good, very clever, and it was quite <laughs> ad lib. Um, you're going to see if you know who he is when this clip comes up. Anne Murray's in, Adams. Anne Murray's in. Yeah, yeah. Neil Young's in, and Joni Mitchell, too. See, Adams? See, everybody's coming in. The man, of course, is Bruce Allen, the most successful entrepreneur in show business in Canada today and for many years past. I knew him when he was a mere fuzzy, chinned youngster, but boy, is he bright. We're going to be talking about tears is... Tears is not enough? Tears is not enough? Tears are not enough. Tears are not enough. But off the top, let's be serious and get back to Jimmy Dean, the other Jimmy Dean, as a critic of banks. It would seem that as early as last July, the government knew, the officials knew, that the CCB was in real trouble. There was a report that about questionable loans, about worthless loans, about should a, mil a billion dollars of loans should have been written off that senior executives desired to become involved in speculative real estate loans. That was about the CCB. We poured billions into that, we think, Northland, and now we have a, a bank which is perhaps much sounder but is in trouble called the Mercantile. To James Dean, I have a simple question. Why should we, the public, rescue any banks that are in trouble? There's no reason that we should rescue any banks that are in trouble, Jack. Uh, there is a qualification to that. Any bank that suffers a crisis of confidence uh, simply as the result of depositors pulling out money for no intrinsic reason whatsoever ought in sound banking tradition to be temporarily rescued. So <clears throat> the difficult thing for government regulators to decide is when the bank is, is in real genuine trouble uh, or whether it's simply a flight of fancy by large depos depositors who are comparing it with other banks and, and so on. All right, let's take the one at a time. Let's take the CCB. Should yeah. the CCB have been rescued by public money? Absolutely not. And they should then. And, and the, the fault of the government was that uh, it didn't identify the problems earlier. It's not entirely uh, a fault that you can point at specific individuals, the Inspector General or Barbara McDougall and so on. It's a, pr it's a problem of a system that grew up uh, in a tradition where banks never failed. Then 10 or 20 years ago, we got the idea that we no longer want feet of clay in the banking system. We want to bring in some high flyers. We want perhaps to imitate the American banking system, more venture capital for Canada and so on. We encouraged smaller banks to come in, but we didn't establish the inspection system and the supervisory system or even the proper uh, insurance system to go with that. Well, we had a CDIC which gave 20,000 guarantee to small depositors, right? Yes. 
And then after some minor panic some years ago, it was raised to 60,000. Yes. Now, here we have in the CCB, the government making an announcement that it was going to meet the commitments of the CCB. Now, that was a political decision, so therefore the politicians were either being too generous with our money or they were being wrongly advised. There's no way they should meet the uninsured depositors' commitments whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I would go further and say that there should be a deductible amount on the insured deposits. Furthermore, uh, banks which run a risky portfolio ought to be forced to pay, uh, to pay higher premiums. The general point is that if you permit a bank to raise money at relatively cheap interest rates with the implicit guarantee that the government's going to bail out every last dollar, Bankers are human. Bankers are, are greedy. Bankers are profit maximizers. Those are the guys we apparently want in the system. They'll go ahead and do it, and they'll push the system to the limit. So we've got to limit the guarantees. Well, look at Northland Bank, yes. right? In the CCB, the government said, Bowie said, we'll put as much money as necessary in to keep it going. Yes. Then they had to change the mind. Yes. In Northland, first of all, they froze it, yes. said it could be saved and then they collapsed it, yes, right? Yes. But the Northland depositors were getting a, a point or a point and a half additional interest for depositing in there. Why? There's no reason to rescue them. A point and a point and a half isn't, isn't very much. If uh, the public had been properly informed about what was going on at Northland, Northland would have had to charge 15, 10 percent extra to draw any money whatsoever. It would have collapsed earlier. And I think the point is that we don't have the inspection system in place to let the investment community know early on exactly what's going on and then let them risk, risk their money with full information. Rather, even the government, this is what's so shocking about the, uh, about the latest information, is that even the government seems to have been lied to by the bankers themselves. The government uh, does not have the staff, apparently, the inspector general, to properly gather the information that's necessary to, uh, to evaluate whether they themselves should go for a temporary rescue, which I think is, is probably justified in the case of the mercantile, or should pull the plug at the beginning, which is absolutely what they should have done and they should have known enough to do in the case of CCB and Northland. Now, if uh, the CCB and uh, Northland had been allowed to collapse on their own, would it have had any major effect on the big five or is it big six banks? I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, I think far more damage has been done by allowing them to collapse after everybody has known that the government made every, rescue, every attempt to rescue them and still it wasn't good enough. Now, what's the score on the mercantile? Are they merely suffering from the, what did you call it? The... From depositor, con we call it a case of the runs, which is a little bit of a vulgar expression, deposit runs. Uh, uh, deposits uh, run off uh, a bank that uh, is compared in investors' minds. Well, what's the difference between the mercantile and the others? Is, are their loan portfolios sound? There's no reason to believe that they're not sound. Uh, I would have said absolutely not two months ago. But so much information has come out that it turns out uh, we don't know. It's become so clear that there's such limited disclosure and limited information about the Canadian banking system that even in the case of Mercantile, I wonder if there's something that we don't know. But uh, assuming that there's nothing that we don't know, the, 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 the point about Mercantile is that it's a wholesale bank like Northland and like uh, the CCB. Uh, so that means that there are large blocks of large deposits which are not insured. And so the people managing those funds simply said to themselves, it's not worth the extra 1% if there's even a shadow of a doubt. that." Uh, uh, and that's unfortunate for Mercantile because although there's probably no underlying problem, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy as a result. And that's an old banking problem. And that's why we do uh, encourage the Bank of Canada the to official, go in there and, and rescue them temporarily. The official word out of Ottawa is that the mercantile is as sound as it seems to be that it will be merged with a big bank. Yes, now those rumors were coming out several months ago, uh, at least two months ago. The, the, there's been talk of a... Of we a had the same rumor about the Bank of BC. Yes. Some months ago, but the Bank of BC seems to have acted quite quickly in selling off the bad loans, even if they had to finance the purchaser, and increasing the capitalization. Yes, I think it's been visibly well managed. Also, it doesn't, uh, be, it doesn't depend as heavily on these large wholesale deposits, on the large uninsured What do we deposits. do now, then? What should, what should we do uh, as a, a nation with some international reputation? What should we do? <laughs> make a policy decision we're not going to rescue any more CCBs or Northlands and make sure that no other bank goes down? Well, we can't do both 
simultaneously. If we say we're not going to rescue them, then we're saying that we are, Im we're implicitly saying we are going to let banks go down and we're going to let banks, uh, we're going to let uh, depositors and stockholders decide for themselves whether the banks stay in business. The key to it is full disclosure and gearing up the Inspector General of Banks so that he can inspect not once a year with, with a two-man staff, but uh, several times a year with a 20-man staff. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I think that and making the uh, deposit making depositors more liable for their actions is the is the is the uh, is the key to it. Here's a man that says you should have a deductible on your bank deposit and it shouldn't be any more than sixty thousand anyway. That's right. Is that right? That's right. You want to shout at him? Yeah. Yeah. Let's have some calls on the banks after the break. <laughs> I don't think there's much doubt that a lot of people's confidence in banks in general has been severely affected by all this caper. Would you? Would you agree with yes, me? Yes, I think that's true. I don't think there's any reason for the average depositor to be, uh, to be worried. I mean, it's absolutely guaranteed under 60000 That's never come into question. What about trust companies? Trust companies, most of them belong to the CDIC. You should ask before you put your money in it, but uh, all the federal ones do, and most of the provincially chartered trust companies. Yeah. Some of the provincially chartered trust companies have had their problems. Of that, there is no doubt. Of that, there's no doubt. Most of them have been insured. Most of the small depositors have got their money. And I'm thinking of the poor people in Victoria Mortgage who thought they were covered by CDIC. That's right. And they're not, of course, covered yeah. by CDIC. Yeah. That's they're why, down the that's tube. That's why I say you've got to ask. You know, in the story of this unfortunate farmer in Saskatchewan who had five-year term deposits in, in, in some trust company and, and anything over four years is not insured, that's in the fine print. Didn't know that. Unbelievable. My goodness gracious me. Go ahead to James Dean. Yes, good morning. Yeah, I was just uh, interested in what you were saying there. Like, we've had all these bank bailouts, and we had the Dole Petroleum bailout, which... Uh, if not to bail out a bank indirectly, I think it probably bailed out at least one of the major banks. Now, we all know about our national debts going higher and higher all the time. And it may be too late to change the system, but I was wondering if the professor would at least acknowledge that we could have done it differently from the beginning if the government had issued uh, the currency rather than having most of our currency come into circulation through the creation of debt by private lending institutions, which we're now bailing out. That's my question. Well, I think it's true that the, that the fact that we so easily run a deficit and it's so easy to print bonds to uh, cover the, those kinds of bailouts makes it easier. It makes it easier to do it. Otherwise, I don't see much of a connection between the, between the debt and the bailouts. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Professor. Yes. Um, number one, where has all the money gone that we're putting up? We're talking about approximately a billion plus, plus, plus. Where has all that money gone? And secondly, under... What right did the uh, directors of uh, Northland give the three top executives three new Jaguars uh, for their beautiful service to the company? That all happened last month. Now, where is the money gone? That's the big question, isn't it, on the floor of the House of Commons? They, they are not revealing the list of depositors. Uh, it's going out. Uh, they, they promised to pay it, and I suppose they have to. Uh, and it's coming from ultimately from our pockets as taxpayers, but uh, it's going to a list of depositors uh, whose names haven't been revealed. You know, we can raise a great scheme in this province any time when some poor soul on welfare steals $1,400 over five years. But when you've got people in the United States who seem to have done very well out of various banking transactions, you wonder where the bleeding justice is, don't you? Absolutely. A uh, call from where? Inuvik? Let me see if I can get it right. Go ahead from Inovic. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I'd like to ask Mr. Dean how he feels about the Inspector General's Department. I feel personally that it's been very lax in looking at some of the smaller banks. I think we need more power in the department, more authority, and more clout to make sure that things run smoothly in, those, in that department. I think it should be beefed up. How does he feel about that? I agree with you. I, I don't know Mr. Kinnert personally. I, I understand uh, from my friends that he's, he's thoroughly competent, but I believe he may be living in a different era where uh, he didn't have to worry about bank failures, and certainly he doesn't have the staff. There's no question about that. Question. How's the weather in the New Vic this morning? It's not too bad. It's cold. It's cold. It's about minus seven, and it's just a skip of snow. Otherwise, it's not bad at all. Call me again sometime. Thank you very much, Jack. Enjoy talking to you. Good. Dawson Creek, go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, for your guess, uh, with all these dubious banking practices and uh, considering all the trade debts in the States and, the Ameri and Canada, 
How far are we? How much can our system take before we uh, totally go bankrupt? I think there's no question at all that uh, the system is 100% uh, is sound. The big five banks in Canada, the big six, in fact, are among the biggest in the world. The big five banks are known internationally. Uh, the Royal Bank is, is the 20th largest bank in the world, which makes it very, very large. Uh, there's, no, there's no problem with, uh, with our banking system. The international community understands How about the that. overseas loans? Remember all the nervousness there was at one time about Brazilian and South American yes, loans? Yes, there's still, Mexican loans? still nervousness. We're not nearly as exposed as the big American banks are. If, if we go down, it'll be because the entire world financial system collapses, starting with the Americans. We're not, uh, we're, we have one of the soundest systems still in the world. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, two questions. First, um, why aren't directors of banks and actual management of banks a heck of a lot more accountable? Uh, you know, if a real estate agent tells you the wrong address or tells you it's the wrong square footage or whatever, you sue them for it. These guys design a portfolio, and oops, we made a mistake there. There goes $22 million down the drain, and we're just going to forgive and forget. These guys drive off in their Jaguar into the sunset. And the other thing is, is what about these loan portfolios that are actually going down? Because I'm sure that if you look down the road five months from now, the people that are taking over these loan portfolios from CCB and Northland and so on, that if they're taking back, say, a, a half a billion dollars in loans, they'll let that interest run up, the big six take it back, and then lo and behold, the big six don't show a big profit because they're writing off this interest expense that was never coming in the first place. So they'll show their 18 to 20 percent profit the first quarter of next year. But meanwhile, they probably had a 70 percent return because they've eaten up all this interest that was never coming in the first place. Yeah, well, I, I mean, your second question, the bankers are, are casting a very cold eye on these loans and they're buying them at discounted prices. And in their best judgment, they're going to make money out of it. They buy them on 35 cents to the dollar. Uh, your first question, why aren't bankers responsible for their actions? Right. It's uh, because uh, we don't supervise them, we don't inspect them properly, we don't force disclosure of their behavior, and also because we guarantee them deposits at 100% bailout rates. Why should we do that? That's the real scandal of the whole thing, guaranteeing yes. the deposits. And all kinds of overseas investors in Northland will get their money back in full, won't they? Yes. Damnable. Uh, yes, damnable. And look at the profits of the banks. Have they ever lost any money in any year in their history, ever at any time, the big boys? A couple just have, not the big ones. Not the big ones. Where am I going? Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. Just to Professor Dean, a couple of things that, that should be pointed out is those two banks that failed were both commercial banks. They didn't necessarily dealt, deal with uh, Consumers. a local person coming in and just putting in a bit of money. That's right. Their account. And the second thing is, you know, when you talk of a bailout, you know, it, it's let the buyer beware. I mean, these people, when they put in 10 million or 5 million, they were getting extra money back. In the good times, we didn't get them extra money back from the banks. They made, you know, huge profits. Look at uh, the Royal Bank this year. I think it's around 120% profit. I don't think we should be bailing, bailing out banks. They take the risks. In the good times, they've done well. They've done well when the interest rates were 19 and 20. And if the times are bad now, then that's, you know, that's their problem. I don't think we should be subsidizing them. Absolutely right. Okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I think that the mercantile thing will turn around, that the community, the, there, there is an in-depth uh, study of it go, uh, being launched now, and it, 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 it will emerge. I believe that the bank is sound. It's backed 25% by one of the biggest banks in the world, Citibank in New York. Uh, it may or may not be merged. It's not going to collapse. I think that this, the problem will die here. Uh, but there's going to be a continuing problem with the small near banks, the, uh, the, the, the trust companies, the, uh, the, the credit unions in, B in Alberta particularly are in big trouble. So there's going to have to be a major overhaul. Uh, Barbara McDougall is going to have a lot on her plate in if the next If she's still year. there. If she's still there. Because it's Mulroney's fault. I don't think it's Barbara McDougall's fault. It's I Mulroney's think, fault. I, I think it's Mulroney's fault. I think it's, I think it's also... He keeps talking about Western banks as if he was doing us a favor by putting billions in to rescue them, doesn't he? Yeah, I think it's part of the Mulroney syndrome that you, uh, you don't want to have a, a plate of stinking... You must you. never be a loser. Yeah, that's it. That's and it. if there's any bad news around, for God's sake, nobody tell the Prime Minister. That's, that's it, precisely. That's the policy of the Mulroney government. My thanks to you, Jimmy Dean. I hope you'll come back again sometime with better news. Thank you, Jack. And uh, next we're going to talk to Margaret Atwood.
Handmaid's Tale is a frightening book. It's a futuristic book where women are color-coded for their various classes of menial tasks and reduced to, in some stages to simple sexual vessels for the production of Caucasian children. Is it kind of a clockwork orange? In that it's in the future and in, the, in that the society it portrays is not pleasant, yes. Uh, but it is from a woman's point of view and a clockwork orange is very much from a man's point of view. So you'd have to say a clockwork orange for girls. Des describe, just for the benefit of the listeners, the Republic of Gilead. Gilead. The, the I take it as a kind of <laughs> Jerry Falwell place. Right wing, fundamental, Baptist, determined to return to puritanical lifestyle where various categories of women and men Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are used as slaves. Well, let, let's be clear that the Southern Baptists are, are fighting it out in the hills against this regime. And Jerry Falwell would probably be one of the first to be strung up because I don't think he'd go for polygamy, do you? No, <laughs> no. you wouldn't. You see, he might go for some of the other things, but he'd stick at that and then, of course, he would be declared heretical and he would be eliminated because my revolution f would follow the form of many other revolutions, the French, the Iranian, the Russian, in which several factions unite to overthrow the main regime, and then they fight it out amongst themselves until one emerges and bumps off all the others. So Jerry Falwell would have to go. He'd have to go. Yes, so would you, Jack. You'd be a prime candidate. I, why would I have to go? I'm a Puritan, I'm a reactionary. <laughs> you talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed to speak at all, but it's a gruesome picture. Uh, don't you think that as a feminist, though, that you've probably made as much moves forward as you're going to make for the next little while? Don't you think that the economic depression is going to push women back into... That's what I'm writing this book about. Uh, but I don't think it's just going to be the, the recession, which seems to be changing around and picking up uh, these days. I think it's more likely to be a fall in the birth rate which has happened already in uh, Scandinavian countries and in Germany. By the year 2020, if, if current trends continue, there won't be any more Germans, they'll all be Turkish. And uh, it's happened in Romania where they've instituted very severe measures about who uh, gets to have children. It's compulsory pregnancy tests every month. Uh, there won't be any Germans because they'll all be Turkish. You're talking yes. about the millions of Turkish cheap labor that won't go back to Turkey from Germany. But also about the Germans whose reproduct reproduction rate is below replacement. Are we approaching that? I suppose we are in Canada approaching that Did now. you catch that MP, one of our very own, who said that yes, our, our birth rate was too low and we were either going to have to up immigration or make more babies, and he said that we ought to make more babies because that was so easy and pleasant to do, he said. Well, is there a not a <laughs> measure of truth in what you said. It depends from whose point of view you're saying it, Jack. Women's place is in the home. The reason for the collapse of morality in our society today is because of the breakup of the family unit. Well, is that not good dogma? Here you have it in the book. Women's place is in the home. There are several different, different <laughs> women in each home. One to be the wife, one to have the children, and the other ones to do the dishes and bake the bread. But they aren't allowed to read. That means all street signs have to go, all signs on shops have to go so as not to tempt them. And so you know who's who, they wear different colored clothing. The ones uh, for birth only wear red, the wives wear blue, the servants wear green, and then there's another category called econo wives for men who can't afford all these different women. They get it all rolled up, up into one. <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? Women's places in the home, but yet what a home. Now, on the other hand, it, is there not, said he, great sociological observer that he is, is there not a, a move now? Look at this. First of all, we had the, the herpes caper, the AIDS, the terrifying AIDS scare. Yes, but you see, that's going to feed right into my book because it's going to knock out a proportion of the population that would ordinarily reproduce. It's the most sexually active people who are susceptible to AIDS. I mean, I don't think I'm going to get it, Jack, and, and then there's it's you. It's highly <laughs> unlikely that I'm going to get it. I don't know, I'll tell you. But you're making a point, though. In fact, you talk, you invent even the new strain of syphilis, the R strain of syphilis. It's here. It's here. A what do you mean it's is, here? It's here already. They've got a strain of syphilis already. I thought that was just army talk from Vietnam. No. 
Oh, that's not susceptible to penicillin. Used to call it the Vietnamese something or other. Anyway, but, AIDS is out overshadowing that right now, but you might as well throw them all into the picture, don't you think? But does the appearance of AIDS not change in many ways? Or will it not change the... Will it not banish permissiveness in many sections of our society? Exactly, it will, yes. Is that not good, though? Oh, it depends, I'm not talking it about depends the what the other effects are. Oh, and how it's interpreted. I mean, there some people will interpret it by saying this is this is a plague sent from above to punish the wicked. I mean, we've heard that already. Wrath of God. Yes, and that kind of thing can quite easily turn into uh, witch burning, head hunting. Um, if you have an AIDS hospital, for instance, full of full of victi victims, and some people decide that those are the wicked, um, why not burn it down? See, this kind of thing. When you get panic in a society, it can very easily get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Abortion, of course. Look at the way Morgenthal has been treated. Now, many people think quite properly that, that these juries were just absolutely nonsensical to acquit him of the charges. Would you, would you back Morgenthal all the way to do his abortions wherever, wheresoever he wished? In clinics at very, any time? It's a very sticky legal problem. Uh, but the main point is being evaded in the usual kind of debate you get about it because the people against Morgenthal are against any kind of abortion anywhere, so why aren't they attacking hospitals? Well, there has not been equality of opportunity for abortions in this country, even, since, even in a proper manner, as I recall. Yeah, well, it's I think Morgenthaler's point is that the law is applied inequitably, and the uh, recent Court of Appeals point was that may be so, but it's not up to you to decide that. Do you see what I mean? Are you glad we've got the Charter of Rights and that the government has put up a multi-million dollar fund to some council on social justice so that anyone who wants to go through the courts on whatever complaint can be subsidized to, to establish equality under the Charter of Rights? Well, it's going to be a field day for the lawyers, isn't it? But something like this probably had to happen at some point. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a mess for a while, let's put it that way. You see, every, every little judge across this country, whenever he gets a case in the charter, is determined to go to kick against the grain, or to go against the grain, so that he can get his names in the law books. I think the charter of rights, which I never wanted anyway, is going to jam the courts from now till the Republic of Gilead appears. Well, let's, let's hope that it won't be, uh, <laughs> eh? that it won't be that. <clears throat> That short a time until the Republic of Gilead appears. I'd say 10 years. The, stature, the status of women today, though, when you go back 10 years, what an incredible difference. Have you won all the go battles? back 20, and it's an even more incredible difference. Uh, no, I wouldn't say. I mean, pe people say, well, we don't have to think about this stuff anymore because basically they've, they've made their point and they've, they've got what they wanted. Uh, when you look at comparative salaries, it's still, you know, 60 percent 60 of what men are making. But you've got to move the man, the women into the men's jobs before they can make the salaries. Possibility. I mean, equal pay for work of equal value. How the hell do you decide it? Well, if let's somebody's just a clerk e in an equal office, equal pay for equal work. Let's just start there. Who would argue against equal pay for equal work? Lots of people. <laughs> if you're that's, what I, that's what I'm saying. This point has not been made. The usual argument is, well, men need more money because they support families. But, of course, there's lots of men now who don't support families at all. And there's lots of women who do. Perhaps so. the qualification for jobs might include those who have families to support, whether it be a man or a woman. Then you're doing what Romania has just done, which is pegging job promotion and salary to whether or not you're, you're reproducing not children. <laughs> You've got to be careful with this stuff, Jack. <laughs> well, I always feel terribly sorry for the man and wife, and she's got no job and three kids out of work. And if you've got a woman, to whom would I give the job? I'd give the job to the man with a wife still at home and the three kids. Wouldn't you? Well, it just depends, you know. It really depends who's qualified, doesn't it? For certain jobs, the qualifications are pretty easy. Look, more with Margaret Atwood and your calls to... They never call you Maggie, do they? At their peril. <laughs> Margaret Atwood, <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Are you in favour? Silly question to ask you, but I have a reason to Margaret Atwood with her handmaid's tale. Are you in favour of full free trade with the United States? No. We need it in the West Coast here. Well, let's We've put got it a this hell way. of a recession here. Yeah. I, think we should, I think we should be absolutely clear about this. I think there should be a referendum 
uh, to the Canadian people as a whole, asking them if they would like to join the United States. And if they would, then our, then our way is clear. Uh, what I'm really against is what the uh, 13 colonies were against at the time they fought the American Revolution, which is control from without, without having the vote. That's what I'm against. Free trade, therefore, means the control of our country, and I would agree with you, full free yeah. trade. We'd lose all our sovereignty and everything would be run yeah. in the American office. So, what, so why not South. get get it clear and just uh, join it or, or not? I mean, now, if, in, in other words, why pay taxpayers' money to support a, a government that is basically uh, taking dictation? And if they're taking dictation, they should be called secretary. So we could have, instead of having the prime minister, we could we could have the prime secretary. But why pay extra? Don't you think Mulroney will do that anyway? I but, mean, a but, good but opportunistic does, Tory. Don't you think he'll do that? But if he anyway? does, why should we be paying him money for doing that? Do you Did, see what I mean? If, I if other guys mean. are making the decisions anyway. Why should we be paying to support these guys? Did you watch that disgusting exhibition at the Shamrock Summit? I heard about it. You didn't see it? Mm-mm. You know, it would put you against certain people who headed Canada Council, I'll tell you. But, uh, of course, as long as we maintain our firm Canadian identity, we have no fear of being overtaken by becoming a colony again, have well, we? Well, that's what Joe Clark says. Yes. Do we have one? Well, he apparently thinks we do. Do you think we do? Yeah, I think we do, but it's probably a different idea from his. But uh, I was thinking of doing a, a Tory musical comedy. Um, it would be called Rose Morrigan. <laughs> That's not bad. Ro Rose Morrigan, very good indeed. And you're big in pornography, aren't you? Big pardon? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Would you like to rephrase that? <laughs> Did you say you're big in pornography? No, no, or? no, no, no. Let me start that again. I don't know why you rattle me. But you always do. I, I'm getting so old. I'm very easily rattled. Big in pornography. What did I mean? Oh, I said you're against any form of censorship whatsoever. Let's say that it's a choice of evils issue, uh, and that we all have a cutoff point and probably your cutoff point and my cutoff point is is the dreaded kitty porn yeah and we would probably both say well, that's you can't have that no um but what's but, the difference though there are people who advocate sex with children for god's sake and you wouldn't even you wouldn't even wipe out their publications i would well i said we all have a cutoff point and i said yours and mine is the dreaded kitty porn i put, take it back okay take it back let's go ahead from duncan bc to margaret atwood yes there's no such thing as equal pay for equal work because men in their chauvinistic way will always help women and women in their motherly way will always help the men to do a job that they cannot do because of the difference of their sex i think that's very sweet and shows a touching belief in in human nature but statistics don't bear it out there's a great many uh, single mothers raising families out there, and nobody much is helping them except the welfare system. Well, that's one of my, not complaints, but one of the great disasters, if you, if you get all the public complaints that I do, are the single families, of so many of which are absolute disasters. That's right. Surely it would be better to try and recreate the two-partner home of How possible. are you going to do it, Jack? Because in the 50s, it was the men rather than the women who rebelled against the family. Playboy magazine came before feminism. I, ha I happen to think that feminism was in part a reaction against the fact that so many men had been reading Playboy and decided that the family was obsolete and they were going to run out on it. I can't argue with you on that. I just don't accept it. I mean, Playboy magazine didn't cause the... the the kind it of was very, family very, revolution. Yeah, it was very, very popular in the 50s, and it influenced a lot of, a lot of men. And Go ahead, I, please. Where's this from? Prince Rupert. Yes, uh, good morning, Jack. Yeah. I'd like to ask Margaret if she believes in any way, not to sound chauvinistic, but uh, if the feminine movement of today is uh, going to indirectly cause the vision she sees in the future in her book. I think that would be called blaming the victim. Um, but there might, in fact, be a, a reaction to feminism. But I think it's much more likely to come for, to, from a reaction to the fall in the birth rate rather than to, for instance, who opens the door and whether or not you can shave your legs. Still annoys me, though, when some woman slams the door in front of me after I've held the door open for... Well, you should try visiting Germany. Everybody slams the door in front of you. All you've got to have in Germany is a loud voice. If you speak in a loud <laughs> voice, people do what you tell them to do. Is that a racist so remark? Yeah, I think probably it is. Well, Margaret <laughs> apologizes for urging me into a racist remark. <laughs> Her fault. Take the complaint to the Human Rights Commission against my Go ahead, please. Oh, Jack. Yeah. 
uh, Margaret, um, I'd like to know what you're really advocating. I mean, I hear a lot of the, uh, the feminist uh, rhetoric, and I read a lot of the literature, and the equal work for equal pay seems important, but it doesn't quite to seem to justify the amount of philosophical work, I guess you could say, that goes into the movement right now. You're talking about syphilis and AIDS, and you're talking about a lot of trends that are going to affect our society uh, in, in many ways that I'm sure we can't anticipate. So what are you really advocating in terms of the, uh, the future of the male-female role in our society? Well, novels don't tend to advo advocate things. If I were sort of advocating, I think I would be a politician, although they don't advocate much these days either, no. do they? Um, I think what, the, what a novel does, particularly a novel like this one, it takes certain ideas to their logical conclusions so that we can see what it would look like if we actually acted it out. In other words, uh, if women's place is in the home and, and, uh, and that's it, why bother educating them? Why put money into teaching them to read? Why give them access to the Bible so that they can come up with strange interpretations of it, such as that all souls are equal? Um, so let's just act this out and see what the results are. That's not advocating, it's logical, it's logical thinking. No unwoman she is Margaret Atwood, who is autographing at Duffy's in downtown Vancouver. Downtown yes, Vancouver? Yes, yes. At one o'clock today, go meet Margaret Duffy. <laughs> Margaret Atwood, <laughs> a man made deal. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to the Raging Rock of Bull after the break. <laughs> Come on, man, we are going to give limousines for everybody. How are you going to feel driving up to the, out, up to the front of the uh, studio to do a benefit on a limousine? Huh? Get a cab for God. No, we are going to reimburse you. It's only 30 bucks. Tears are not enough is the Canadian contribution towards famine relief in Ethiopia. The man who organized the Canadian one is none other than my old friend Bruce Allen. How many big stars did you get together? 53, Jack. Name, and this is Maureen what? Maureen Jack. And you're the? Executive director. Name the 53 stars now. <laughs> oh, give me a break. <laughs> I want the 53 names right now. Okay. I'll give you the big names, Jack. There wasn't a big name that missed except for Paul Anka, who uh, lost his voice in Atlantic City the night before. And the other big names? Brian, Brian Adams, Adams. Corey Hart. Joni Mitchell. Gordon Lightfoot. Neil Young. Can we watch a curtain Cummings. And who, this your film, can we use a bit of it now? You bet. Go ahead, yeah. Jack. Let's see a clip, and then we'll get back to the Raging Rock of Bull. <laughs> What's happening? Tears are not enough! Yeah! Anne Murray's in, Adams. Anne Murray's in. Yeah, yeah. Neil Young's in and Joni Mitchell, too. See, Adams? See? Everybody's coming in. all unfolding right uh, right as I was driving across the bridge and I really honest to God imagined Gordon Lightfoot singing the first two lines come on man we are gonna give limousines for everybody how are you gonna feel driving up to the out, up to the front of the uh, studio to do a benefit on limousine huh Get a cab for God. No way I'm going to reimburse you. It's only 30 bucks. Do you like the song? Yes, it's a very good song. Can you sing a few bars? Uh, not, uh, well, uh, let me see. I'd live no, it for no. us. <laughs> This 
struggle that people are having in Ethiopia is the most real struggle there is. It's the struggle to exist, the struggle to stay alive. As a human being, it's your right, it's your obligation to, to give something, whatever it is. And this is what we do, so this is what we give. For me, it's um, a painful experience to be here and to see my people dying. I know we all share my grief, but nothing is close to be to have your roots there. They're hardworking people, they're religious people, they're generous, they're beautiful. And when I see them reduced to skeletons, it, it's very painful. Feed the world. When I heard that line, do they know it's Christmas? I said oh, yes. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Wrong, we're in the wrong movie. Wrong we're in the wrong session. movie here. Now, this is really? for the Canadian film, okay? Isn't this, Canadian version isn't this the thing with Bob Geldorf? The... No, 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 no. It's not. This is the one with Ann Murray. This boy, boy George here? No, no. Gordon the guys from Wildwood. Alien. Oh, I'm in the wrong. I gotta get out. I'm in the wrong thing. But, Paul, wait a minute. I gotta get out of here. But, Paul, we're talking about feeding the world. Okay. Can we go rehearse? Yeah, let's rehearse. The role of a of a record producer is uh, maybe a friendly battle is a good way of describing it. It's, you do live on the edge. I mean, uh, you got to get the performance. You got to be strong. You got to be diplomatic. You got to be a psychiatrist. You have to be a babysitter. You have to be a mother, and you have to be a father. Uh, and then, um, and you screw up sometimes. Uh, you know what? I was wrong. It, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> The spirit just seemed right, and it was, you know, it was just my intuition, you know, that it would be uh, a good roundup of people that I had to be here. We can make it work! <laughs> <laughs> we can make it work, for God's sakes! <laughs> we can learn to share and show how much we care. We did about two or three more, and she just politely right, said, uh, I don't think that's as good as the first one. Okay, uh, we'll play them both back. Okay. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay. You know, uh, and we played it back, and she was just dead, right? It was the best out of the four of them. Um, but hey, how was I supposed to know? You know, I just met the girl. All right. It's really you know, Marie? Love it. Hi, Ryan. Nice to meet you. Hey, you doing All good. right. You got You're it. not doing bad for a damn no young punker, are you? <laughs> Ryan, do you know Marie? Who is this guy? <laughs> 47 coming out of the sky. Won't you take me down to Memphis on a midnight ride? I want to move. Innocence, but other than that, it was great. We'll go again, huh? One more time. Somehow, our... that's my sound, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just came out of makeup and I've got Richard Gere scared to death. <laughs> Get even angrier with it. We can break the distance. Okay, I'm yeah, really mad good. now. I'm really mad. What? All right. We can Perfect, but...
it one more. Oh, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> On Sunday, February 10th, 1985, 53 top Canadian artists recorded the song Tears Are Not Enough for African Famine Relief. But behind that was a real organized panic. And two of the people at the top of the organized panic were Maureen Jack of Northern Lights for Africa and my old friend <laughs> Bruce Allen. Bruce, uh, what is, this is a full-length movie about making the thing for Ethiopian farm relief. It's a 90-minute movie, Jack. It's done by uh, John Zariski, who won an Oscar for uh, Not Just Another Missing Kid. And actually, Garth Drabinsky graciously donated his theaters for two weeks, for, uh, gave all the proceeds towards Northern Lights for Africa. It's at the Royal Center here. And we're actually going to open it in Los Angeles so it can qualify for an Academy Award in the documentary field, because it's a tremendous movie. He did a great job. We've spent seven months on it. What did it cost? The movie? Yeah. It didn't cost Northern Lights anything. Not There's a nickel. No overhead cost. All the people that worked on that film donated their time. They spent hours and months putting it together. And any of the additional costs that were involved with uh, any of the labs or whatnot was picked up by corporations. Is it showing all across the country now? Yes. It's in, well, it's in the nine, <clears throat> the nine major cities. And it's only there, you see, for a limited run of two weeks, and we're halfway through the first week right now. And you want to give it a good shot in the arm? Well, you know, I think a lot of people... She's quite bright, isn't she? ...probably <laughs> wonder... That's why she's the executive yeah. director. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think, how can you possibly make a movie about a three-minute song? It's going to be incredibly boring. You're going to hear the same song over and over again. But what Zaritsky's done is he has really portrayed the whole Canadian music scene. But you saw the start of that with Alan there. Well, whether oh, you yeah. know it or not, I worked beside Alan for eight long, noisy, <laughs> turbulent, screaming years. He threatened to belt me half a dozen times. He terrorized <laughs> old Jack Wasserman. He screamed at everybody who came up the stairs. In fact, the police used to come on many an occasion thinking it was a riot. It wasn't. It was only Bruce on the telephone. <laughs> Is that not true? That's all true, in it, but it worked, Jack. We, though, everybody thinks it was a monumental task getting, this people, getting these people together, but actually it only took four days. The hardest part was just the logistics. Everybody wanted to do it. It was just making sure they could all fit it into their schedule. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a lot of screaming and yelling, and, and, but it wasn't that much cajoling. No, it was just get out, get out here. Come on, what, what do you need? What do we have to do in the air? Who do we have to get to donate the flights? You know, that kind of stuff. Flights were donated, flights all were costs donated. picked up by everybody. How much have you raised up to now? Over two million, about two and a half million. Two, and what are you aiming at? Well, you aim as high as you can get. We have no, we have no limit. As much as we can get, Jack. Tell me, did any of them turn out to be real difficult? No, no one turned out to be difficult at all. That's what we were, that's what we were panicking about because I've had. Think of all these egos. Look at the egos you were dealing with. Yeah, Which not, were the worst egos? Which uh, were the worst egos? The worst ego? Yeah. Probably Paul Anka that didn't come. He should have come, even though he lost his voice. He should have just stood in the chorus. Yeah. Because nobody would have known. But does he, of course, there were old people in this too, weren't there? Neil Tommy Neil. Hunter was here. Tommy Hunter was there. He's drawn the old pension now, must be. <laughs> he came told. up from Florida. Ronnie Hawkins, you know, the he's like the one. granddaddy yeah. rock and roll here. Annie Murray, how old is it? Oh, Joni Mitchell, yeah. they're getting on a bit now, aren't they? Oh, Joni Mitchell, yeah, and, and uh, they came up from California, and uh, it was amazing. The, the amazing thing with those people, both Joni and Neil, is they still retain their Canadian roots, and they really identify with Canada. And, of course, Neil Young's done a great job with Farm Aid. Oh, yeah. And uh, Sylvia Tyson, another old-timer. She was there, yeah. But the, who was the greatest star of them all there? I think Brian and Foster really shone, you know, because it was, it was Brian's song and just, it was Foster's minute, production. Please. Brian who? Brian Adams. I'm sorry, doesn't everyone know? <laughs> oh, yes. He's Canada's Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen. Yeah, but you got to remember one thing, the difference between Brian Adams and Bruce Springsteen. What's Jack. that? When Bruce Springsteen was 25, he was playing clubs. And how old is Brian 25, Adams? 25, and he isn't playing clubs. No. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you got a little time to spare. Can you take yeah. some calls? Sure. Jack Will you answer to. questions about any of your people? Any of my Brian people. Adams? Yep. I was there the day you discovered BTO. Well, I wasn't, but I was around. Yeah, you, oh, you were there. Oh, yeah. You were right at that time, and uh, I hear there's still, uh, in fact, there was a feature on them a couple weeks ago here. They're still in business, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, you t do your own plug. Give a 30-second plug into that camera and what you want people to do. 
Well, I want them to go out and see this movie because I, they'll love it. The 90 minutes flies by. You see every star that's ever been in Canada working together. You hear their philosophies on life. You hear the best music you could ever imagine. You watch, it's like Hockey Night in Canada Into in the, the studio. Camera. And you've got a week and a half to go see it. And what we're trying to do here really is provide a fabulous entertainment value for your dollar. It makes you proud to be a Canadian, It Jack, really does. Because there's some great talent here and we forget about it all the time. And the Canadian people have given so much. And this is a way that Northern Lights in many respects is giving back. They can go see the movie now. The video cassette's going to be on sale in a few weeks. It's $29.95. And for every other 90-minute video, you'd pay $60. And yet they still know that 60% of that is going straight to Northern Lights. But it's on at the Royal Plex Cinemas. Cineplex, Royal, Royal Theatre. Royal, Royal Center Cineplex. Royal Center Cineplex. Yeah. Right. OK, time for some calls to, to Maureen Jack and my balding friend, Bruce <laughs> Allen, after the break. Bruce Allen, Maureen Jack. Subject, tears are not enough. Call from Victoria. Is that... Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. I'd just like to say that uh, I think it was a great song, great production, great video, and hopefully a great movie, and I'll certainly go see it. Thank you very much. But I also have a question for Bruce Allen. Go yeah. ahead. Um, I enjoyed uh, Brian Adams' first two albums very much, and then I did stop listening to him because his sound became just like Loverboy, just like Corey Hart, just like every other band in the land. Well, I don't think Brian Adams became just like Loverboy. I think that Corey Hart made a conscious attempt to become just like Brian Adams. But uh, I don't think he succeeded. I, I can't help it. I mean, I think Brian Adams is unique. I think he's unique in his field. And I don't think there's any comparison between the two acts. And uh, I think Canada should be real proud to have him. He's really done a lot for this country's music industry. Go ahead from the Nanaimo. Hello. Uh, first, congratulations on the movie. Uh, my question is, when do you think Canadians will get over or stop battling their uh, little sister image to the U.S.? To the US? Wow. I don't think we'll ever get over it. I think uh, it, it's really frustrating to me. I know exactly what you're saying, is that we uh, seem to be only happy if we're in second place. I mean, we were just talking about the star system between a Corey Hart and a Brian Adams, for instance. The Canadian press always sets it up as a competition, as if, as if the two are rivals. They can't seem to reconcile the fact that they might have more than one or two superstars. I know exactly what you mean, because the American really, Americans really take their own under their chest, and then Canada just seems to push them away, and after they uh, embrace them for two or three years, they tend to dump them. And it's really too bad because you can even see the press now possibly starting to turn on Adams because he's too successful and it's just too bad. What to do to change? I don't know what we can do to change. I mean, we boo Wayne Gretzky, who's probably the finest piece of hockey product ever turned out in this country. I think we boo everything that does well and I don't know how to change it. I think it might be inbred. We'll grow up. We <laughs> will. We so. will grow up. I don't boo Wayne Gretzky. Who do I boo? <laughs> Hari uh, Neil. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I, my question is for Bruce. Go ahead. And I was wondering why Backman Turner Overdrive was not involved with this, seeing as they were such a big part of the 70s. Um, when we put this thing together, uh, Randy Backman was in his latest reunion, which was the Guess Who reunion, so we took one member from the Guess Who, which was Burton Cummings. After the Guess Who reunion flopped, Randy Backman decided to put the BTO reunion together, and they were done after I put this thing together, so we only took one guy from each group, and at that time, Randy Backman was in the Guess Who again. That answers it. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, why did Brian Adams um, go for Coke instead of Pepsi? Why did Brian Adams go for Coke instead of Pepsi? <laughs> I probably had a lot to do with that, because I probably drink more Coca-Cola than anybody in the country, and it would have offended me terribly if he went for Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good questions. <laughs> go ahead, please. Um, How's the music industry heading in Canada? Like, I think we got some better, fantastic writers in Canada and great musicians. It's, it's the strongest it's ever been. There's no doubt about it. And we're breaking more acts in the States all the time. And the movie shows. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was, I'd like to say that <clears throat> I'm very happy to see the um, way the music, the popularity towards the musicians. Nowadays, the musicians are very selfless. Instead of, as in the 60s, there was nothing but drugs and... You know, it, all you ever heard was negativity <clears throat> from the older people. And now to see in the 80s how the reflection of the musicians, to see how much they're, they become involved and how much they're setting an example to everyone. There is no one that can sit and watch and listen to a, a song such as 
what we have in Northern Lights and not be impressed and not be tremendously moved. Well, the whole music industry, I think, has gone back. A lot of the flash and the glamour has gone out of the music business now, and it's back to honesty. And I think Springsteen, Adams, John Cougar, people like that are in the forefront. And I think that's what the people want to see now. They want some honesty from their stars. And also, you know, the, the hard life these guys lived in the 60s and early 70s really took its toll. And we're all smart enough to look back and say we don't want to look like that when we're 35 years old. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah, Bruce, I heard I, uh, I read an article that uh, Adams said he'd like to sing with uh, Paul McCartney. What do you think? You think that might ever happen? Um, I don't know. I think, I think Paul McCartney is probably one of the better MOR artists right now. Uh, Adams is a rock and roller. It might happen, but uh, there's nothing on the foreseeable future for it. Go ahead, please. Yes, a comment for Bruce Allen. Uh, you can't deny the popularity of Brian Adams, but I dispute the comparison with, with Bruce Springsteen as, as to uh, where he performed at, with, at a given age. I would suggest that if uh, Brian Adams can have an album that sells with, to the extent that Born in the USA does, at, uh, at, after a length of performance time that, that uh, Bruce Springsteen has had. Why don't you ask me that after I put out eight albums, okay? <laughs> Fair enough. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Bruce and the rest of you. I'm uh, just wondering, <laughs> you, how do you feel, Bruce, about the... the uh... Yeah, how do you feel about the... Sorry, how do you feel about the 20% Canadian content? Do you feel that's a, a uh, big plus for the Canadian music industry or it's holding them back? It's a great help to mediocre artists. All it does is replace the black product in the States. That's the only difference of our charts. And, and a lot of times we've had hit acts in Canada. I've managed them, for instance, like Prism. There's been acts like Trooper and other acts like that that have been number one across the country but couldn't break in the States. And you've got to remember this, that the musical taste isn't too different between Seattle and Vancouver or Buffalo and Toronto. It's just that the American programmers down there look at it, look at it as a government legislated hit. And I think it hurts some of our artists. Uh, go ahead, please, from Victoria. Yeah, um, I'd just like to give a word of praise to both of you. I think you've done an excellent job with the project at hand. And Mr. Allen, uh, I've watched your uh, career go from way back in BTO, and I'd just like to say keep going. You're doing uh, the Western Canada music uh, people good justice, and keep on yelling. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Good, he fooled you. Didn't, he fooled me. He didn't yell this morning. <laughs> Go ahead from Fort St. John. Hello, this is where the Northern Lights really shine. And anything that can reduce me to tears at 10 a.m. Is, is just profoundly touching. Can't wait to see the film. Miss Jax, do you think this will get into remote areas like ours? You said you're at um, six major cities. No, we're so used to hearing that here. Any hopes? I'm not sure if we'll be able to get in the theaters and all of the smaller centers, but the video cassette will be available throughout the country. That's my Christmas gift to several people. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good stuff. You got lots of friends, haven't you? Yeah, oh, yeah. sure do. Go no, ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I was just curious who the black singer is who does the solo with Brian Adams. Donnie Gerard used to be in a group called Wildflower. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. What about them? Just to be in a group called Wildflower? Well, actually, the group was called, uh, the song was called Wildflower. The group was David Foster's first group, and I can't even remember the name. Um, I forget. I'll pick it up later. Somebody will tell you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. I'd like to ask a question for Bruce. Yeah. Scott Bruce. Mark was the name of the group. Yeah. Uh, no, I was wondering, what could you recommend for young bands who want to get progressed, like get the next step after they write some stuff? Um, first thing you got to do is memorize my phone number. Yes. And after that, after that, just get into your own material, write your own material, and also make sure you don't get trapped in the club trap. Because if you play in the clubs for too long, you'll get used to making 2,500 bucks a week and you won't want to take a gamble. So just make sure that you just use the clubs for a bit of live performing experience and then get on with your own material. Okay, That's thanks a lot. Don't forget, if you're okay. making 25 or 3,500 bucks a week in the club, you're liable to get trapped and ruined. That's right, because you'll be making 2,500, 3,500 dollars for the next 10 years, splitting it seven ways. Oh, that's right. Splitting it somewhere. I missed that. Go ahead, please. How am I for time? Yes, good morning, uh, Bruce. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned whether or not if uh, Bruce Coburn was involved in this project. You know, Bruce Coburn, it was so important to me that Bruce Coburn was involved because he's one of the most aware people and the most concerned Canadian artist that has ever been in this country. And we actually... Uh, to Jim Valance actually took uh, the, the tape over to Germany where he was performing in East Germany, waited until he came into Hamburg, went into a studio there and dropped his line and videotaped it, and it is in the film. It was very important for us that Bruce Coburn was in this on this song. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello. I'm wondering, uh, you've heard of the Vancouver Seeds album. Yes. I was in uh, Nova Scotia and I heard it, and it was great as far as I was concerned. But is there any other cities that do similar things to this? And also, why can can't Canada 
you listen to an album in Vancouver, but it's not out in Nova Scotia at all. Because you got to understand that these records are made by local radio stations. Q107 has one in Toronto, Shome has one in Montreal, and uh, they all just play their own record on their own stations and nobody else helps each other across the country. And uh, it's, just, it's just a local project to raise money usually for a local charity. That's the problem. Okay, thank you then. Okay, Ma oh, what about that What did I do? My fault, never mind. We got some time, Jeff. You got some time? Oh, yeah. More calls, that for, please. Let me have some more calls now to Bruce Allen, or rather to Maureen Jack and Jack Webster. And Bruce Allen is also here <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Maureen, you've got in two and a half million already for Ethiopian relief. What are you doing with the money? Well, we've allocated one and a half million dollars that is at work in Africa right now. You mean you've sent the money there? Yes. Who uh, got the money? Well, we had a, quite a selection process, but we narrowed it down to seven agencies that will be working for us in Africa. The Red Cross, UNICEF, CARE, Canadian Physicians for African Relief, BC Save the Children, and Plenty of Canada. So they get the money, not for short-term relief, hopefully, but for longer-term projects. Yeah, our criteria for choosing the, the projects to fund was that it would meet an immediate need, but in a way that would help the people on a long-term basis. So the money's gone already. That's great. Nobody's sitting on it trying to... No, no. The, one of the major programs is trying to help the people get out of the relief camps when they've been brought back up to physical weight and supplying them with what they need, the oxen, the seeds, the fertilizer to go back to their villages and... Uh, Start life again. Morning, Jack. Bruce Allen, Jack Webster. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my name's Barbara, and I just wanted to say I really like Corey Hart and Brian Adams, and they're both really good Canadians, and we should be proud to have them. But I also want to know if there's anything that we can do in schools to get involved with the Ethiopian project, because I'm in my grade 12 jazz choir, and I want to know if there's anything we can do to help out, because I'd really be interested. I've seen a lot of schools across the country put on their own concerts, their own talent shows, and raise money for African relief that way. You give us a call down maybe at the office and we could yeah. point them in that direction too. Yeah. What's your phone number? Did you give out your phone number? Yeah, Northern Lights can give out the phone number, sure. What's Northern Lights' phone number? 688-7274, area code 604. 688-7204? Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Cam Loops, go ahead, please. Good morning. I'd like to thank you very much for the uh, song that you wrote of all the Ethiopian relief songs. It's certainly the most touching, but I do have one question. Let we only we got a problem. three hours of live aid coverage in Cam Loops, and I received a tape of the performance from Friends. Why was there so little Canadian content on either sides of the Atlantic? For live aid, when we have so many outstanding performers, they uh, they asked only. It was a, it was basically a, an American show. They only asked two Canadians to come down. That was Neil Young and Brian Adams, and uh, you know there were so many stars to, to choose from that we are fortunate even that those two made it. And uh, that what can we say? You know, it was a worldwide event, and those are the two Canadians they asked, and that's who showed up. And we got two of the best. And we got two of the best. Good. Go ahead from Cumberland. Hi, I've got to first congratulate Bruce and Maureen with the movie. I absolutely loved it. I saw it in Victoria. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, I've, I'm an avid fan of all the West Coast talent, but I've been wondering what's happened to Chilliwack lately. Chilliwack is uh, trying to reform, and they're currently playing bars in Vancouver. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Maureen. Yes. Hello. I don't know if you remember me from a few years ago, but what happened to Blue Northern? I remember when you first started out in this business and... Uh... First of all, do you remember him? <laughs> Are you happy to remember him? Oh, absolutely. Is he a good memory? <laughs> Great it's memory. Not a bad... No, <laughs> this guy. Yes. All right, what happened to... What was his name? Blue Northern. Blue Northern. Are they still together? Uh, Blue Northern actually has come back of late under a new name of Cement City Cowboys. And what happened was essentially... In the Canadian marketplace, it's difficult for a country rock band to exist because of the demographics of record sales in a small population. But the guys are still together and still enjoying good music. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay, how did the Brian Adams really start off? Like, you know, hey, Bruce? Yeah, who did he start off with? How did he start off? Uh, how did he start off? He started off as a writer. He was signed as a writer first. He still considers himself a songwriter, much more than a performer. Oh, did he first get to you or did he get to somebody else? He first got, he first got to uh, me, but it took him a year to do it. But he had persisted and I finally gave in. Good. <laughs>
Go ahead, please. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah. Congratulations on the movie. Thank you very much. I was wondering if you could tell me why Deep Purple didn't play their uh, Smoke on the Water encore last April here in Vancouver. They got in a fist fight backstage. They don't get along that well. They just got together for the dough. <laughs> oh, is that right? Eh? Yep. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now, there's an answer. <laughs> they got in a fist fight backstage. They don't get along very well. They just got together for the dough. <laughs> Bow! <laughs> Yeah. That's the most honest answer I've ever had to a question in all my life. Wrong one. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was curious to know why Sherry Ulrich and Anne Mortify were omitted from the uh, from the group. I mean, we can go on forever and say why people were omitted and why they weren't omitted. The first thing we did is we wanted to get high-profile people. Unfortunately, Sherry Ulrich and Anne Mortify aren't as high-profile as Anne Murray, Brian Adams, Corey Hart, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Gordon Lightfoot, and so on and so forth. And also, if the thing was done in Toronto, we only had so many tickets we could get out from the West from Air Canada to send people back there, so we went for the high-profile people. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, Bruce? Yeah. Could you tell me what the government in Ethiopia is doing for famine as well as yourself? Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to be distracted in that. That's something else again. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Money. Yeah, I'd like to know what Bruce Allen thinks about the government bailout of the VSO. Of the what? VSO, Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. I think it's pathetic. I think that uh, I think that if nobody wants to go see the symphony, then to hell with the symphony, shut it down. If the arts can't stand on their own two feet, all it proves is nobody wants to see them. So don't force culture down our throat when we don't need it or want it. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you mentioned the little sister of Canada, the United States. I was wondering if the uh, factor was the uh, music industry being uh, behind technologically. Our music industry being behind technologically? Yeah. No way, we're not behind in any area, recording studios or anything else. Go ahead, please. Yeah, who are the top upcoming acts in Vancouver right now? Who are the top upcoming acts? The upcoming ones. Who do you pick for stardom? Oh, uh, Jack Webster and uh, Katie Lang. <laughs> Uh, Kate, Katie, Lang, Katie Lang's got a shot. Actually, you know, Katie Lang's actually Elvis Costello in a dress, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, wa watch for the head pins. Maybe had they have a shot. Idolize also. Those are the two big ones we can think of. And uh, have you got any top names coming into your uh, fold, or...? I'm gonna... I, I figure I've set the Canadian music business... Uh, I've, I've brought the Canadian music business into respectability, so the next act I'm gonna bring up is a kid from Australia, and we're gonna work on the Australian music business for a while now. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> Because they're big in movies, they should be big in rock. Also, Jack, it's a real nice place to live during the winter. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, congratulations, Miss Jack, on your work. Uh, Mr. Allen, I spoke to your office uh, a couple of months ago asking a question with regards whether a Canadian artist could get off in just Canada, and the question was posed to me, why would someone want to do that, write a song that just made it in Canada? Do you think that market is there to be tapped and support an artist as a writer? I do not believe that a Canadian artist can survive financially survive just by being a Canadian artist. I think they have to spread internationally. We just don't have enough people. Time for one quick call from Seattle. Quick, you got 10 seconds. Uh, yes, Bruce, how could I collaborate with Brian Adams? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people asking that. I don't think that's possible right now. He's got one collaborator who he writes with, and that's Jim Valance, and he's very content, and I hope he's going to stay that way for a long time. C, tears is not enough. It's on for an R not enough. It's on for another 10 days at the Royal Cinema. Royal Center at Georgian Brar in Vancouver. And where else? Victoria? Victoria it's in Victoria. A anywhere else in BC? No, those no. are the two cities. And the in video BC. cassette, Jack, coming out, that's when everybody can get to see it. Buy the video cassette for Christmas. My thanks to Marty and Jack, and my thanks to my old buddy, Bruce Allen. Thank you, Jack. Break. Close look at BC's economy as the topic for Monday, the Thanksgiving holiday, and I shall be here with a panel of distinguished guests at 9 a.m. precisely. As every day goes by, how can we close our eyes until we open up our hearts? We can learn to share Show how much we care Right from the moment that we start Seems like overnight We see the world in a different light Somehow our innocence is lost
British Columbia Television, this month celebrating 25 years of broadcasting for British Columbians. Close look at BC's economy on Monday at 9 a.m. precisely. A look at the economy of BC on Monday at 9 a.m. precisely. Good news on the employment scene in BC.